Welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything exchange-traded funds. I'm your host, Bob Pisani. After years of taking a back seat to index investing, active investing in ETFs is having a moment. What's going on? Let's talk with Steve Sachs. He's the COO of Goldman Sachs ETF Accelerator. And Todd Sohn is the ETF and technical strategist at Strategus. Steve, so we, we know ETFs are, you know, mostly index base, but active seems to be having a moment. Why is that? Yeah, no, without a doubt, Bob, and that, you know, it's a little bit of a myth still in the market and that ETFs are passive. Uh, what really started to happen, you know, a few years ago, and quite frankly, more than a few, first active ETF in the market in 2008, but what's really happened rather quietly in the last three to four years is this growth of active strategies, traditional, think bottoms up fundamental stock picking strategies that are coming to market in the ETF wrapper in the active form. Still transparent, still daily liquidity on the exchange, minute by minute liquidity, but essentially, you know, active strategies as opposed to the pure passive that we're used to. And the growth has really been tremendous over the last few years in particular. Three years ago, active ETF assets represented less than 1% of overall ETF assets. ETF assets have continued to grow. Active now represents nearly 7% of all ETF AUM in the US. You know, uh, Todd, uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, active stock picking isn't quite what we used to think it is, though. It's evolving, right? I mean, you yeah. and I think old school means alpha generating stock picking, but it's changing. There are active definitions today where you can be defined as using option overlays to protect on the downside, like JEPI, for example. It was very successful. Um, is, is it fair to characterize that as, as, as active? The, the market's certainly evolving. It's quasi-active, isn't it? What would you call it? Yeah, to Steve's other... point about the growth in assets, uh, active is now in this kind of different shade, right? You still have your traditional bottom-up stock picking, right? that's still very much prevalent. But now you also have active hands at the wheel in terms of the option overlay strategies, right? And that's a very sophisticated strategy I don't think the common investor really knows about. And that provides a different approach, right? It could be downside protection, it could just be monthly and type of income. Uh, you still have a very high conviction thematic active, right? That's your arc type strategies too that I think will still exist in some form or another. Um, but I think this is all part of the, the active umbrella now. It's not just a singular star money manager. It is going all sorts of different investing routes. And I think that's going to continue, continue to tribute to um, the growth of the AUM. Yeah, I, I like to think of certain forms of active. We're talking about sort of almost index plus. I have my friends at Dimensional Funds. I talk to them and they consider themselves active managers. But it's this. Uh, uh, there's an indexing, but then there's a slight active management component on top of it. I think it's all great. It's all part of the evolution uh, of the business here. You know, I, I, what I am surprised at is, uh, Steve, about how many old-fashioned stock pickers there are uh, out there that are turning to the ETF wrapper. Now, I know uh, they helped, uh, Goldman helped Jeremy Grantham of GMO start his first ETF. Uh, that was, uh, I think, November of last year. Um, he's a very famous uh, stock picker. Uh, he started a quality ETF, QLTY. Um, Brandis, uh, one of the big stock picking value firms that's out there, uh, launched three ETFs in November. You helped with that uh, as well. There they are up on the screen for you. And there's the GMO. Uh, that's Grantham's uh, ETF. Uh, it, it seems, um, uh, Steve, like the lower fees the passive ETF industry is charging is, is sort of forcing the the hands of the, the old fund managers, aren't they? I mean, they're, they're, they're charging a lower fee here. To a certain extent, and it's interesting, and yeah, the third one we just launched, a third client, was Eagle Capital, EAGL is the ticker, just launched this week, actually listed here at NYSE, $1.77 billion in assets on, on day one. Uh, so it's interesting, when you think about really across, you know, all three of those organizations that we've partnered with at the ETF Accelerator, first and foremost, the use case across all of them was largely the same. How do we deliver our particular brand of investment strategy and be wrapper agnostic to our client, both to react to the existing client base, but more importantly, and just as importantly, the demographics are changing. I mean, right, you talk about this all the time, the generational wealth transfer that's taking place in this country. The next generation investor prefers the ETF wrapper, right? And it goes back to a little bit of what you were saying about, you know, passive versus, versus active. Here's what you need to remember about an active ETF. It trades, still trades on an exchange, 
like the New York Stock Exchange, it is still transparent and it is still liquid at all times of the day. And ultimately, right, what we've been seeing from an asset manager perspective is not necessarily always reacting to lower fees, but essentially the more streamlined, efficient wrapper of an ETF doesn't typically have the layers of fees that the traditional 40 Act mutual fund has. Plus, obviously, here in the U.S., a big driver is just the tax efficiency of the wrapper itself and being able to employ uh, truly bottoms up fundamental stock picking uh, or fixed income credit selection in the active ETF wrapper is where we're just seeing all the demand now. Well, this is a good thing, right? I think money goes where it's treated best, whether it's in the form of sector investing or just global asset allocation and the ETF is that form in the fund industry. Yeah. You get the tax efficiency, it's lower cost, it's transparent, you can get the liquidity you need, as Steve mentioned, and investors like that, especially the younger generations now. That's really important. You know, but not to be cynical, and you and I have talked about this before, if you're a mediocre stock picker, folks, in a mutual fund wrapper, you're still going to be a, you're not suddenly going to turn into a superior stock picker in an ETF wrapper, right? Active trading is, is still on the defensive, I, I think, especially now that we've had very long-term studies like the S&P's, the SPIVA report, I always do that every year, that indicates the vast majority of active managers do not outperform their benchmarks. You should check it out, folks, uh, if you don't see that before. But, you know, my, you, you understand my point. I think it's terrific that the lower fees help the, the performance. I mean, we, this is one of Bogle's big insights 50 years ago that much of the alpha that is generated by the small minority of active managers that do outperform is destroyed by the cost of the fees. So if you can reduce those fees in an ETF wrapper, that might significantly help. Yeah, the, the, the lower fees absolutely help. And I think the, the proposition for an active manager, depending on what the strategy is, you have an S&P 500 that has five stocks at over 25% of the index. That has benefited massively for passive investing right now, but it may get a little speed, a speed bump at some point. And having that active hand at the wheel or having an option overlay for the strategy may help at some point. I think that's also a key thing to uh, yeah. keep in mind. The business is evolving. You know, it's one of the things you've been here. You're a veteran in this business. I've been covering ETFs for 20 years. And what's amazing is to see, besides the, the fads that you go through, the pot ETFs or crypto ETFs or even thematic tech, you know, they jump on the bandwagon. Bitcoin ETFs now, they keep coming and going. Uh, it's like a constant um, popularity contest, and ETFs are very good at that. But the industry is maturing, and it's, it's, it's fun to watch that mature. Money still comes in every year. A lot of it's still, pa still passive and indexed. Um, but it's fun to watch active management. It's fun to watch higher-priced mutual fund managers move into the more efficient ETF space. It's, it's, it's part of a natural evolution. Yeah, and I love that word. You said it earlier, and I actually love what you said, Todd, relative to, right, money flows to, you know, what is the most efficient strategy? And fees absolutely have something to do with it. And I agree. The evolution, I mean, right, and I appreciate you calling me a veteran, not just old. Uh, I appreciate the... the <laughs> Quasi compliment. I there, usually Bob. get called old. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so look, I, I think you know all of those things are true. It is an evolution. When you think about not just the ETF wrapper, I said this recently. When do we get to stop calling this the ETF industry? Right. The ETF is the wrapper. It's the delivery mechanism, and it happens to be one of the most, if not the most, commingled you know, highly regulated delivery vehicle for asset management strategies, whether they be passive or now, whether they be active. And so fees certainly matter. But the other aspect, again, you know, what's the other aspect of ETFs, you know, from a tax, you know, from an efficiency perspective, tax efficiency. It's a very interesting white paper out there that talks about and makes the comparison between a S&P 500, you know, index mutual fund versus a uh, ETF. And the actual tax differential or alpha, if you will, uh, is nearly 92 basis points a year. That's a big difference as well. When you think about the relative performance rankings, it's not just fees, but the difference between being a top decile manager and something below It is that, 90 basis points yeah, <laughs> easily. That, it could, less than that would be. So that, that's huge. Um, but it is an industry, and you're, you're part of that, the industry. You, you, you think, folks, that have all the firms that want to start an ETF would be already out there. I mean, we've been doing this for 20 years, but it's amazing. There's still hundreds still in the wings. Now, Goldman formed an accelerator unit. You, you're the guy running it to help create ETFs. Tell us about this accelerator unit. What do you, what do, you do? Yeah, well, I'm, I appreciate that compliment. One of many. So I'm the global CEO of the ETF accelerator. And, you know, it really came out of the whole idea for the business actually came out of, you know, my previous role at Goldman, uh, where I was ending up with a lot of meetings on my calendar, others in the organization the same way, 
our core institutional clients were calling and asking, how do we get into this ETF space? How do we deliver our strategy active and otherwise in an ETF wrapper? And ultimately, we were helping them how we could, free consulting essentially, and then obviously supporting them through the capital markets function as we do. And the idea was the drumbeat got so loud that essentially the idea was why couldn't we do something more? So what did we do? We launched the ETF Accelerator, which is a platform that allows our clients to come in, launch, list, and manage their own ETF, but do it off of the technology, infrastructure, and risk management expertise that Goldman's known for, and essentially get to market faster and cheaper than they could do it on their own. And I think that's what's resonated again to date, as we talked earlier, GMO, Brandis, Eagle Capital, uh, all felt that the journey to build it on their own would be too expensive and too long, uh, and they didn't want to miss the opportunity cost of not delivering their investment strategies in their so wrapper. It's sort of like a turnkey operation in a way. So I have an idea for an ETF. I come to you, you help launch it and list it, but I still, um, I still man uh, essentially manage it. I, that's sort of the limits of what you do. You, yeah, you basically help get the thing out, out the door. You are the advisor. It is uh, your investment strategy. It is your intellectual property. It is your brand. It is your name on the fund. But what we're doing in the background, both initially to get the fund listed uh, and in the marketplace and then on an ongoing basis is actually doing all of the things that uh, are infrastructure related uh, relative yeah. to the, you would need to build out years of expertise, headcount, bodies, and all of that risk management framework. The idea is that we do both services around listing and getting your ETF to market, but ongoing management services of it as well. We help you do what you already do, which is pick stocks and, right. you know, uh, raise assets. So what, what, I mean, like I said before, you'd think like all these ideas were out there or all these companies that want to go public or, excuse me, want to set up ETF structures have already done it, but in fact, there aren't. Is there is there a real ongoing business here? I, I'm, it's a leading question because you wouldn't have set up the accelerator if there was no, but the, Tell, tell us a little bit more about what potential business there still is out there. Yeah, it's interesting. It's a great question, Bob. So ultimately going back to, and, and look, there were a number of things that uh, I would say coalesced in the asset management industry that brought us to this point, not the least of which was 6C11, the ETF rule that was passed in 2019. Well, we wouldn't call that a big boom. It was certainly a catalyst. And the idea was it made it easier to launch an ETF, but it didn't make it easy. So really ultimately going back to why we started it, uh, at one point we had more than 41 clients that had called us with exactly the same problem. How do I do this? How do I move quickly and can you help us? And I'll be honest with you, it's you know, ultimately pretty rare for 41 of Goldman's you know, institutional clients to call us with the exact same problem. So right, what is Goldman Sachs at our core? We are advisors to our clients first and foremost and the idea is that we wanted to be able to solve a problem for them. Sometimes we solve those problems for short periods of time, i.e. liquidity in the capital markets. Other times we solve them for longer periods of time by providing them longer term solutions around infrastructure. But honestly, you know, that was three years ago and the demand and drumbeat has not stopped relative to the not just traditional asset managers, mutual fund managers right. and like, but the number of hedge funds, family offices, RIAs. Are they thinking of getting into ETFs? Absolutely. Hedge funds? Absolutely. Family offices? Family offices. So it's not just like, see, Brandis doesn't surprise me. That, that's a famous firm, value firm. They've never been, they're a mutual fund company. Correct. But are there, are there a lot of Brandises out there still that, that, you know, in the mutual fund business that, are looking at this. I mean, we know, we know how many how many tens of thousands of mutual we, funds. We, are we out like there. to make fun of ETFs because there's gimmicky ones out there. There's yeah. no doubt about that. And they, and they close up shop within 12 months, but there are double the amount of mutual funds and ETFs. So yeah. that's a lot of, of of runway. Plus all the separately managed accounts that are out there from some family offices that may find a use case in, in converting. Yeah, but it's interesting, Todd. Right? You know this stat. Last year there were nearly 500 ETFs launched in the U.S. alone. There yeah. were less than 200 mutual funds launched. Uh, last year, and I don't think that number was much better the year yeah, before. Yeah. Big shift. So, so yeah. you think we'll see hedge funds launch ETFs? We do. We do, definitely. I mean, based on the number of conversations uh, that we're having with our client base, and then not just that, but when you think about the use case, I mean, right, what's one of the things that uh, the ETF gives you for 
lack of a better way to put it, you're tickerizing your portfolio, but right, what you're doing is you're actually also broadening your distribution footprint. And by that, I mean access, right? You're democratizing access to your strategy. Do I think that we'll necessarily see uh, the very esoteric or highly sophisticated uh, strategies that are deployed in certain hedge funds today? No, but I think that there's some very good portions of those strategies, whether that be long only, long short, hmm. that actually do make sense for these hedge funds to essentially do what everybody else wants to do in the uh, asset management industry. Again, what do you want to do? You want to be wrapper agnostic. More and more hmm. of their clients, particularly institutional clients, prefer liquid vehicles side by side with gated or you know LP type yeah. vehicles. And it, what I find interesting is you, you don't necessarily have to be brilliantly innovative. For I mean, Brandis is the three funds you launched with Brandis. They're One's a value fund, one's an international, one's a small cap value. You might say, don't we have enough small cap value funds in the world? But they're stock pickers. They have a slightly different interpretation of what they're going to be holding because they're active. They're not index guys. Correct. So you can say, here's our, here's our philosophy in an ETF wrapper, and you, you might get just fine in terms of assets under management to keep things going. What you don't want is to have those people leave that mutual fund to go to another place where they think they can get the same thing a lot cheaper. Yeah. That's what you don't want, I think. You certainly don't want that as, again, the business that you're in is asset management, right? Uh, and that is a for-profit business. But it's interesting, uh, I think any number of our clients would tell you the opportunity cost of not doing it is greater because if you don't have the wrapper, what's going to happen? Eventually those assets are going to leave and go to a competitor. Well, that's that my point. It's yeah. a competitive business exactly. here. Exactly.